this is your first time to watch, the purpose of this channel is to help meet people that have had exceptional stuff in their life. I call it big stuff. And what they do to get through it, over it, around it, and stay happy. So I'm Michael Ballard, and this is... Althea Rahm. So Althea is here today to share one or two items of big stuff. And we're going to learn a little more about her. So thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great. So you know why we're here, because we've just reminded everybody. Big stuff. Yes. But can you tell people before we get started, what do you do now? What do I do now? I am an integrated wellness coach. Okay. What that means is I work with women to okay. be strong, fit, and healthy, mentally, emotionally, and physically. <laughs> An integrated approach. Hmm. hmm. I've heard that used before. I wonder by who. I don't know. Well, who, yeah. <laughs> I talk about your rational, emotional, and physical selves all the time to people and say, mm -hmm. and I really don't talk about spirituality, but it's really important too. Yeah. yeah. So, but I don't get into that. It's not my area of comfort zones or expertise. It's just yeah. important. Yeah. So good for you. Yeah, I enjoy it. I start with uh, looking after uh, what they're doing food-wise, uh, getting some healthy food into them. Healthy food makes you feel better, makes you sleep better, move your body a little bit, more and confident. When you have better fuel, because food is fuel. Food is fuel. I talk to people with chronic illness on occasion mm -hmm. or often, depending on the year and groups, and I always say, I think we should eat exceptionally well 19 meals a week. And then there's the social meal you have with a whole bunch of people, and maybe you eat okay, but it's just okay. But then one meal a week, as long as it's not dangerous, I've been known to have high-quality ice cream for, for a meal. Well, I always do the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, eat healthy. The other 20%, do which one. You know? Well, I guess I'm harder on people. I always say it's 2 out of 21. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Okay. I guess I'm like, what? <clears throat> 9% and you're 20%. Okay. I'm 20%. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really interesting then. So your clients are all face to face or do you do them in groups or? Uh, virtual. Virtual? Or face to face. Okay. We do mo mostly virtual. We start with a questionnaire. Okay. And then we discuss that questionnaire for an hour, an hour and a half, either through Skype on the phone or if they're in the city, face to face. And then once a week we chat about how they're doing. We look at their eating habits. Things are how things are going, how they're, if they're moving their bodies, are they sleeping better, are they feeling more confident in themselves and what they're doing. Sleep's a big issue for me mm -hmm. because at one point I had a chronic illness and then I ended up in the hospital with cancer and so it's hard to lose your sleep because then it's hard to cope with everything when you don't get enough sleep. Very much so, yeah. And your body has a hard time coping with life if you don't get enough sleep. It's kind of a vicious circle. You lose your sleep, you start eating comfort food, your brain's not working properly, you get upset with yourself, you sleep less, you eat. It's a circle. And it's just a vicious circle that's down for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I had a client that said, Michael, but I'm 109 pounds overweight, that's too big a number. I said, well, if I work with you, I don't want you to lose 109 pounds. First 30 days, you're going to lose 7 pounds. Oh, but that's not a big enough goal. I said, and you've been having these goals set for you for how many years? For 20 <laughs> years, you've been wanting to lose 100 plus pounds. I always say, how many times have you lost that 100 pounds? Yeah, so... I don't talk, I don't even talk in pounds. Yep. No scales in my world. Well, in my world, it's just... Yeah. Because I don't, I'm not a weight loss person. Yeah. They had other bigger issues than yes. the, hard to believe, 109 pounds. I said, but no, I just think you should aim for 7 pounds. Yeah. If you lose seven pounds, you're within striking distance then of only being two digits overweight. If digits are that important to you, yeah. they were a scient They are a scientist, mm -hmm. so measuring was really important yeah. to them. I do body measurements. I don't do weight measurements. I'm not disagreeing with you at all. <clears throat> I, I used to be a scale jumper. I used to take it with me <laughs> everywhere. And on vacation, it would be on the ground. It's yep. all like I. And that's why. So I that's do really it. interesting. Okay, so that's yeah. that's really interesting and valuable work. Yeah, it's it. I love it. Uh, myself, I was an uh, obese child, anorexic a couple of times, into fitness, bodybuilding, powerlifting, always being judged by my weight. So uh, in 2010, I got off the platform the last time. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. No one's going to weigh me anymore. I have seen the pictures. She really <laughs> was on the platform. I have biceps and calves that were that fit. <laughs> I've always had that extra eight pounds in the middle. <laughs> it was I, fun. It was a fun time. Well, it's always interesting to push yourself as mm -hmm. long as you're not in danger. Yeah. 
and stretch your comfort zones. I took martial arts. I don't like fighting. I don't even like pretend fighting. <laughs> but for three years, I went and had pretend fighting, sparring under controlled conditions. And I found out remarkable things about me that I thought this body was good for music and other things, mm -hmm. hard work. I found actually I'm an adequate to average martial artist. There you go. Emphasis more on adequate than average. But you did it. But I you did know what? It. And that's the main, that's what I tell people all the time. Go take the first step and go and do it. And you'll be surprised. So you help people change. Yes. Physically, rationally, emotionally, because we don't get physically fit or we don't change our body shapes unless we change rationally and emotionally. Yes. Because having had a client with a hundred and some odd pounds of overweight for 20 years, they'd had 20 plus diets. Oh, easy. And I'm not a <laughs> diet expert, but they had a bigger issue than just a hundred plus pounds. Yeah. So they came to me because they said, I live in a small remote area. Skype is amazing. Yes, I love it. And I've decided that I'm going to hire a life coach and you're it. Perfect. Because I'm a scientist and I live in this small remote area and there's no peers and contemporaries even to hang out at work. Mm -hmm. Everything I do is remote. That's wonderful, work-wise, I get a lot done in the peace and quiet. There's nobody to hang out with, to brainstorm with, except, and it's not the same thing. No, it's not, no. So that was a real eye-opener to me about remote work. That was yeah. really remote work. She had to drive, to fly, to drive, to get to civilization. Oh my, I couldn't do that, I need <laughs> I know, there was three or four hours of driving in there and a 90 minute flight, there was no roads. Ooh, mm -hmm. no. I, I like my people time. I do too. Yeah. So, the purpose of the video, as we said earlier, is about people confronting things in their life. Personal, career, volunteering, and what they do about it. So I know you've had a career in IT. Yeah. I know you were a, 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 vol a, a bodybuilder. Yes. And you walked <laughs> away from that. Yes. But along the way, you hit some bumps in the road, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, a few. And I so... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hoping today you'll share one with us. Okay, so when I, uh, after I got married, my mother-in-law was up. She actually sheared her brain on a vice in the basement. Yeah, it was pretty nasty. And then uh, we had like hospitals, respite care, all kinds of things going on. My daughter was born in there and she passed away, four years of that. And then six months after that, my father-in-law came to us saying that he had cancer and he had less than a year to live. So we ended up selling our house, moving in with him, looking after him, going through all this, and we just kept, I just kept going and going and going and going. Like I didn't right. even think about what I needed to do, I just kept doing it. Uh, my son was born actually three weeks after my father-in-law passed away. We bought a house, another house, moved in, I bought my parents a house, they moved in, and 10 days after my mom and dad moved in, my mom had a stroke that took two-thirds of the right side of her brain. Ouch. So as I say, I'm just moving forward, moving forward, not even thinking what's going on. It's just, yeah, yeah. that's kind of shut down. Just, okay, I have to do this, and I have to do this. But now my mom is in Mount Sinai, and they found out my dad had cancer. So they put... <laughs> So my mom was in Mount Sinai, my dad was in Toronto General. I had uh, a son under a year and a daughter who was not even in school. She don't. She just started junior kindergarten. Wow. So you know, I just keep moving and kept yes. moving, and I always looked at. I can't say the positives, but the, the the things that you could do that made life easier at the time. Like uh, it was heartbreaking that now my mom passed away actually 21 years ago, uh, came out of the hospital with problems and my dad's cancer was, uh, they operated and he was fine. Ah, so he got stable. He got That's stable. That's great. So then, uh, so what, when they were both in the hospital at the same time, people would say, well, how do you cope? And I used to say, well, you know what, the good thing is they're across the street from each other and there's a tunnel in between. So. <laughs> You know? Well, it means one parking and one trip back and forth as opposed to driving back and forth. And Yeah. So it's just, I always looked at something that was good in what was happening. Yes. You know, and then, uh, well, my mom, as I say, she got out of the, they both got out of the hospital. My mom passed away uh, three years after that stroke. And then uh, my dad passed away after that, probably about four years after that. 
But as I said, I just kept going, okay, look at the good side. You're in a rough spot now, but tomorrow will be a better day. And so that's how I cope with things. Okay. So that sounds easy to do. It's not but always it's easy. Tough to do. <laughs> and it, if I if I was a therapist and I had my and I was a licensed therapist, we'd call that framing and reframing. Yeah, always. Here's the issue. Mm -hmm. Is there another way, another angle, another way to look at it? Yes. Yeah. And so it's a really powerful skill. It's kind of the way I live my life. Actually, uh, my kids and I were out one time and we saw this plaque in, its store, in a store and it said, today's crisis is tomorrow's joke. Okay, so now not, it doesn't mean that, you know, someone passing away is a crisis and it's, not a, it's no. not a joke. But if like the little things that you think, oh, the sky is falling and then the next day it's like, okay, the sky is still there and I'm here, so it didn't fall. I had somebody tell me the story of the flat tire. So they, smaller than a death, but yeah. they're driving home from a meeting with a client. It's all exciting. They're in a brand new vehicle, less than, <laughs> less than a week old. So that's yeah. pretty brand new to that's me. Pretty, uh, yeah. And they get a flat tire. Mm -hmm. Now, they have a child that's going to be waiting for them getting off the bus in grade two. Mm -hmm. So rather a young child. It's cold out. Mm -hmm. And they have a flat tire. They didn't make plans because it's a brand new vehicle. What could happen? <laughs> yeah. This is pre-cell phone. So they decided they were going to change a flat tire in record time being safe. I said, how'd you do? They said, under nine minutes. <laughs> and their daughter was off the bus waiting in their little ante room that didn't have a lock on it. Uh -huh. So she wasn't going to freeze. He said, they was good for a couple hours in there before she'd get cold cold. <laughs> I said, but what? Any, any downside? They said, yes, the new suit pant knees were kind of beat up. <laughs> well, you know, you could do pretty well. I mean, you get into a situation and you think, okay, how am I going to get out of this? What's the best thing? And I think with all the illness and death in my, uh, in my world through that time, it's kind of like nothing is that important. Because that's like if, if, four family members with life-altering issues and right. only one yeah. came out. In, no, they all went. But, okay, but your dad so, survived initially. Initially, yes. 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 And then, um, so it was kind of like, okay, so like, when the things happen like a flat tire, I had a problem with my car a couple of years ago where it needed new rims and I wasn't prepared to buy new rims. So I was getting like uh, rim leaks, flat tires all the time and people would say, oh my God, it's a flat tire. And I go, yeah, it is. It's a flat tire. <laughs> it's a flat tire. And in my world that I, uh, with my clients, they'll say, oh, I had like this double chocolate fudge sundae with peanut butter and da 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 da. And I went, yeah, it's okay. Are you still here? It's not a life-altering event. It's a sun Sunday, you know. So I'm, that's kind of where they, I, I work. Perspective. Yeah, always. I remember having a very tall manager at one point, and we were doing retail consulting. Mm -hmm. So he's six three or taller. He's tall. I'm not, and my <laughs> client was four foot seven. Okay. So t diminutive, tiny, but taller than. <laughs> or him. <laughs> and, uh, and you see what you see from your perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm five foot nine, or I was. With age, you shrink just a little. Start to 25, I'm told. When I was powerlifting, I shrunk an inch and a half, but I think I have it back. <laughs> Some of it come back, yes, I believe. And so I remember my manager leaving the store, this lady owned, saying, You know, she's meticulous. But I want you to come back with fresh eyes the next time you visit and bring a five foot step ladder and look down. <laughs> you could see where she stopped dusting because she couldn't reach any taller and there was a dirt ring around the whole store. Oh, really? <laughs> he said, I look straight at the dirt mm -hmm. and up is gross. Yeah. And he helped train me to look at the floor and the baseboards right up, turn around, look up and look right back down again yeah. and do a 360. He said, 360 this way, 360 this way. It sounds basic, he said, but some of us are tall. And that store is so dirty, it's gross. Yeah. And he said, yeah, it's meticulous from about five foot ten down. Yeah. So I bought a ladder in, mm -hmm. and uh, I proceeded to fix something. Okay. And in fixing something, gently introduced her to the fact that things about five nine, five twelve were filthy dirty. Oh. And she was mortified. I'm sure. Because she was really professional, really hardworking, and she just never noticed that way up there. Because <laughs> when you're four seven. 6'3 is pretty much a hard thing to fathom, yeah. is what I would imagine. Yeah. 
So that was small but big, mm -hmm. because dirt ruins inventory in yeah. the retail world because it ages it. Very quickly. And that means you throw it out. It's a waste. It gets written off against profit. And who wants to throw profit out? Not me. <laughs> so your biggest skill to your client, I think, is you give them perspective. Yes. And then from there, you have, when I work with little kids, I talk about your thinking and your feeling and your body are all together. They are. And if you don't acknowledge that you're thinking, you're feeling, and your body are all together, then things mm -hmm. won't work as well. Yeah. And sometimes, you're, as I tease with the kids, your thinking's over there, and your feelings are over there, off camera, yeah. and your body's going, which way do I go? Yeah. <laughs> Come together. And so, we do similar and different work. Yes. It's that acknowledging that it's together. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it only sh supposed to be together, it isn't. So that's really a powerful, powerful mindset. Yeah. And, and an integrated approach mm -hmm. sounds complicated. I don't believe it always has to be. No, no. And I also uh, give up perfect is something that I'm <gasps> very uh, adamant about. I, uh, there we go. <laughs> I don't know her this well. This was not pre-planned. No. I tell people that exceptional yeah. and excellence are a great way to live. But perfection is a quick trip to illness. Well, I used to be the perfect, <gasps> a perfect mother, perfect employee, perfect kids, perfect house. <sighs> yeah, I had a bit of a bump in my life. Yes. And uh, someone said to me, you know, if you weren't so perfect, maybe things wouldn't be so difficult. So I uh, went home to my kids and I said, so we're giving up this perfect stuff. Uh, and that uh, took a lot of courage because that was a belief in value system you had. Huge. But this bump was so huge that I knew that I had to give it up. And when mm -hmm. someone actually said it to me, that's what, you know. I wait. believe that a lot of anxiety in this world is based on, I must be perfect. Uh, very much so. I suffered from anxiety at one point. And it was because I wanted everything perfect. I taught career search, as you know, for a long time, and I got hired to teach how to be resilient at job searching. Because mm -hmm. 400 rejections, or worse still, mm -hmm. 400 job applications, and nobody acknowledges you even took the time to apply. Yeah. That hurts. It does. Well, do that a thousand times. It can really start to hurt if you let it weigh heavy. Yeah. And so, yes, we identified as we did research to put the program together that perfectionism is one of the reasons why people give up. Well, I've applied to 500 places, I'm more than qualified, they didn't talk to me, nobody wants me. Yeah. Because I've done all I can to be perfect. Right. Okay, well that was a big lesson. That was a really big lesson for you. Oh, for me, yeah, yeah, it was, wow. it was massive. It was, um, I really changed my life after that. And I know uh, my kids' friends, they came, like, you know, as they grew up, the kids were always there. And then after this change you know they're still coming and we were sitting around one night and they're older we're all having a glass of wine and it says really changed a lot out the <laughs> over the years you know we used to be afraid of you uh, okay so <laughs> yeah. very good mm -hmm. so i'm getting the following that framing reframing looking for another way to see it is big yes very much so that having the courage to say, this is my beliefs and value, but it's not serving me or others well, so I'm going to have to adopt another way. Mm -hmm. And it's doable. It's doable, like a little step at a time. You know, that's in my world, I, people say, oh, you know, I want to do this. And I said, well, why don't you just do this? And then you get a win. And it gives you a little confidence. And then you get another win, and another win, and another win. And you look back and think, wow, I did all these things. So let's do some more. That ties in with my lady that had 109 pounds to lose, but mm -hmm. she had bigger issues she'd approach me with. Mm -hmm. said, well, you're not talking to me about being doing weight loss, but why don't you tie that in? Yeah. But don't lose 109 pounds as a goal. Oh, that's scary to me. Yeah. Let's aim for seven pounds in 30 days. Yeah. That's, and you know, for three months in a row, she lost nine pounds a month, and she went, wow. This 109 is no longer 109. I said, no, let's see, 109 minus 9 minus 9 minus 9. I said, you're into double digits, and yeah. you're on your way to only losing 50 pounds, mm -hmm. having to lose, wanting to lose 50 pounds. Yeah. Because in her words, 
I've always been a big girl, and I like being a big girl, but I'm not a big girl now. I'm past being big. <laughs> that was her words, not mine. Okay, I never good. physically met them. I met them on Skype, and uh -huh. we did a lot of email as well because yeah. they had internet connection issues being so remote. Yeah. So we did a lot of email coaching. I don't really like email coaching. I want to look you in the eye because if I say a word and you flinch, I hit a nerve. I hit a nerve. We need to explore, and, and no judgment on my part. Just yeah. Learn some more about your truth. Yeah, and that's, uh, I like face to face better. So do I. So do I. Mm -hmm. So, this is quite a journey you've been on. It's been a big journey. And mm -hmm. I hear another attribute here. Word isn't spoken, but I'm going to put a lay, I'm going to label you. I hear courage. Courage to change. Courage to change and, and um, knowing what you, uh, not necessarily knowing what you want, but knowing that, okay, this isn't serving me well. When I got, I was an IT manager and I got laid off in 2009, you know, the, uh, they had a, a placement agency, I guess, a woman standing outside the door. Now I knew I was getting laid off and all this other stuff. And I was laughing. And uh, because I, the shock had hit me a couple of days before it got let out of the bag. and mm -hmm. So I was ready for it in the, uh, the woman that the placement per person, she said to me, are you all right? I said, you know what, this is something that I didn't like doing anymore and I needed to, to get out of it. <clears throat> so being laid off is probably a really good thing. And I had a good severance, etc. But I will say that, you know, a couple months down the road after that, it was like, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so I was kind of, uh, actually I went to my brother's in uh, Potrero, California, which is just uh, north, southeast of San Diego. Oh, yes. And we built a vineyard. Oh, wow. And <laughs> yeah. hey, what'd you do when you get laid off? Oh, I went and helped build a vineyard. Yes, okay. Exactly what I did. <laughs> well, you had some transferable skills from IT to building a vineyard. Yeah. You have yeah. to be organized. Yeah, but you know, at three months in the mountains, uh, I can't thank my brother and his wife enough for like letting me be there because it's it kind of cleared my mind of, yeah, I'm not, uh, my kids were older, they were like, and it's like, this is my time, and I need to figure out what I want to do. I, Very lot, good. I had a lot of skills. I just had to figure out where to put them. Yep. Well, figuring out our transferable skills is a do another whole talk another time. Yes. <laughs> but part of being resilient and having the courage to frame, reframe, and move on in life yeah. is what are you good at? Yeah. And I found it remarkable that in this day and age, some people don't spend four hours trying to figure that out their whole life. I bring them into, I get, they get sent to me or I have them in a, in a transformational class where yeah. the company's paid for me to be there and they're like, wow, I never knew this. And you're going, you had a 20 year, 35 year career and you didn't know what your skill sets were. Wow. Well, I think that happens to us. You get into a, a job and you do the job and it's like, this is what I do. And you don't think you can do anything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I work with a lot of women to say, well, you know, I bet you could do that. Let's try it. Let's see if it's possible. So that's, uh, I find it interesting. I, I, in the job search course I did and the resiliency program I offer, mm -hmm. I get people to do an inventory of skills. Mm -hmm. And some of them are like, yeah, well, what I did at 12 is insufficient or insignificant now. I said, oh, I know somebody, me, but I don't tell them that, who got a career position against people with far more in, far more education and experience because I showed leadership skills between 6 and 12 years old with the Boy Scouts. Oh, I remember the guy saying, networking is a waste of time. And I said, well, if you think so, but my brother's friend, I named him, his brother works for Steven Spielberg. But I guess you wouldn't want to meet him because you don't believe in networking. <laughs> so you're just going to get a job by replying to ads in the newspaper. <laughs> You want to see a shocked face. Yeah, for sure. So don't for assume sure. that because we're living in rural Ontario, I don't know people. Yeah. Because I find everybody interesting and everybody's got something to teach me. So, you know, yeah. into the diary they go, or into the address book. Might never speak to them again, but you never know. You never know. Oh. It only took seven minutes to, to get the information. Yeah. And I'm going to re-hook up with this guy next month about career transformation. Beautiful. Because he went from being a graphic designer and artist to now a photographer and other things. I bet he loves it. As he said, I used to work nine, ten months, 16 hour days, and then I'd take three months off to decompress, mm -hmm. and then come back and start all over again. And yeah. eventually went, 
I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> yeah. So now he does uh, a photography assignments mm -hmm. and has the time of his life. Yeah. And oh golly gosh, sometimes people lend him the top of the line photography equipment so he gets to take new toys. There you go. Mm -hmm. wow. So that was a lot you shared. So okay. thank you. So framing and reframing to me sound easy to fall off your lips. It sounds easy. Getting someone else's perspective really helps a lot. And, and that's where having friends and acquaintances you can trust to tell the truth yes. that aren't going to blab to anybody. That's right. And it helps you bounce things back and forth. Mm -hmm. And yet, even though you had a mom and a dad in two different hospitals, it sounds small, but looking on the bright side is at least there's a tunnel. Yeah. But having had a daughter and having been the person in the hospital and a father in the hospital, that twenty to fifty dollar parking bill every day adds up. Yeah. So only one parking bill every day instead of two yeah. and no driving is a small blessing, but nonetheless a blessing. It was, you know, and then I was in one location. Uh, and when they did get out of the hospital and out of rehab, they didn't live far away. So I mean all these things were good and at the time I wasn't working, which is also a blessing because of all this through those 14 years of all this going on, if I was working and raising the children, like had two small children and had all this happening, I would have found a way to cope. But it was lucky that I didn't have to find the next way. <laughs> yes, because healthy coping keeps you moving forward and keeps you safe and stable. Mm -hmm. There's lots of unhealthy coping. Yes, there is. Uh, some of you have watched other videos know I talk about having, and she's safe and well now, but my daughter had a brain tumor. Yeah. And what, during those struggles, her mother and I on more than one or two nights had a little red wine therapy in moderation, but it would have been real easy oh, yeah. to have the whole bottle each. It's very easy. So. And it's uh, just coping, and I worked out. And I was lucky at that time, too. I had a gym in my house. So you had yeah. physical exercise to yeah. help you burn off the stress. Which is what I still do. I know back in the days when, uh, when it was just the kids and I and we were still in that house, they would say to me, Mom, could you go to your room? <laughs> <laughs> the room being my gym. Yes. <laughs> but it would be like, I think you really need to go to your room, Mom. <laughs> so I hear some big big lessons for you though was the re the framing reframing to see a new perspective the exercise the the small blessings some would say gratitude yeah very much so and perspective having somebody to tr ha having people you're connected with you can yeah. trust and talk to mm -hmm. so big issues and big deciding things. to believe in yourself <gasps> sorry <laughs> don't be okay so there's another I'm one sorry, I need another sorry I just had to <laughs> Because that's a big one for me. But also. you see, that also speaks to another one, which is playfulness and respect. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Okay. So thank you very much for your gift of time and for thank sharing. Thank you. You know, we're not looking for a life it. biography here, but uh, people looking for 10 to 30 minutes of, so what did they do when they were stuck or when big things happened? Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time. I'm pleased to be here and thank that's you. That's great.